Okay, good morning. This computer's being weird, so hopefully we don't have any issues during class. <clears throat> so um, this is the homework assignment. Hopefully you've already started on it and are working on it and are studying for the exam, which is on Tuesday. And at the end of the class today, we'll talk about um, what to expect on that exam um, so that you kind of can hopefully better prepare over the weekend. It shouldn't be too difficult, but I say that with um, the caveat that don't take that to mean you don't need to study. Um, just be very mindful of the topics and how they relate to what we've done previously. So today we're moving into new waters, which is entropy. And this is probably the subject that students struggle with the most in this class. Um, today we're talking about it mostly conceptually. We'll do a little bit of, of entropy calculation and, and use some of the equations. but. Um, as we, as we go through this discussion, if you have questions or you don't understand something, please raise your hand because chances are that somebody else is struggling in the same way that you are. Um, that it's, it's not a concept that is um, easily measurable. It's not something that we just understand readily because we experience it in daily life. You know, we can kind of understand work and heat and, and some of the other property values, but with entropy, it's a little bit tricky because it's, um, we use it both as a property value and also we recognize it as materials change state. So it's similar to enthalpy in that it's um, sort of a measure of, of, of chaos versus energy, um, but it's also similar to heat transfer because it's, it's recognized during a process. So um, keep that in mind that it, uh, it might be difficult to understand at first, but hopefully you're reading the text um, and then hopefully I can also shed some light on it today. So when we've talked about the second law, we, we noticed that there were a couple of expressions that were, um, were inequalities. So when we looked at reversible versus irreversible systems, we found that the thermal efficiency or the coefficient of performance is always going to be greater for a reversible system than for an irreversible system. Okay, and we took that fact with, um, with, uh, with at face value, we thought, oh yeah, of course, if it's reversible, it's going to be better. Um, but entropy kind of explains why. And so these inequalities um, will allow us to better understand entropy and the fact and the, the factors that it that it plays in uh, in energy transfer. So another important inequality that um, was derived by Clausius, the same who um, who made up the Clausius statements about irreversibilities, is this, and this, this funny little symbol here is the cyclical integral of del Q over T is less than or equal to zero. Okay, and we'll talk about that, that, uh, that term um, as we go through, and it's derived and the proof is given in the text, but I don't feel like we need to necessarily derive it or prove it, um, but we do need to understand it. So for a cycle that's internally reversible, this del Q over T the cyclical integral of that is equal to zero. So if it's not internally reversible, meaning it's an irreversible cycle, that means that this del Q over T is less than zero. Okay, so it's only for an internally reversible cycle that the equality holds true and the cyclical integral of that del Q over T is equal to zero. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, if we have this system, and this is the, the way that the Clausius inequality was derived, using this, um, this uh, heat engine that is depositing heat to, um, to this compressor, it's sort of hard to see, um, this piston cylinder device, and that there's a work output from that system, and then there's also this work output from this reversible cyclic device. Um, so the, the derivation, which is also given in the text, showed us that in order for work to be a positive output, we would have to violate the, the Kelvin-Planck statement. Therefore, this inequality is, is, uh, is negative or less than or equal to zero. So if we go through this process, we can prove to ourselves, which um, I can leave it to you to read in the text or just believe that it's true, that we cannot um, perform a cycle on a device with a, with a transfer of heat over a constant temperature and have it be greater than or equal to zero. It has to be less than or equal to zero. 
And it's because at the end of a cycle, properties have to return to their original states. For example, volume will be the same at the end of a cycle as it was at the beginning. So in a piston cylinder device, we expand and then we compress. And so we have this now new property value that we want to define. So noticing that this del Q over T showed up a lot in the derivations and the analysis that was being performed by Clausius, he determined that he was going to call it a new property and that it would be called entropy. So the definition of entropy is that the change in entropy, or ds, is equal to this del Q over t. And again, it's defined in this way because entropy is primarily recognized during a process, that the, the entropy changes because something happens to the system. It's not, um, it's not always um, uh, like a, a quantity that we can measure but we recognize it in the change of the system. And so this entropy will be based upon the initial and final state of the system as well as the process that it undergoes. So total entropy in a capital S form, similar to other property values that we use, it's an extensive property, meaning it depends on the size of the system. But just like all other property values, we can divide through by the mass to get lowercase s, which is an intensive property. Okay, so we treat entropy like it's a property even though it behaves quite differently than some of the other properties that we've encountered before. So rewriting this, this, um, this integral, uh, we call it ds, is del q over t. So then if we perform the integral, we can say that delta s, or s2 minus s1, is equal to the integral from 1 to 2 of that del q over t. Okay, so this is the base equation that we start with as our definition of entropy change. And then from here, we'll be able to do some additional things with it. Okay, so entropy is useful to us when we look at second law uh, properties of systems because we can determine how irreversible a system is by using this entropy analysis. So when we think about entropy in the grand scale, we can look at it as its disorder or randomness. Um, and substances that are in higher energy states, for example, a gas, will have a higher value of entropy than substances in lower energy states, like a solid. Okay, so the zero entropy state for pure substances is defined when they are, um, when their molecular motion no longer, uh, like the, the molecules are no longer oscillating about one another. Okay, because we know exactly where they are, we can determine that in the solid state, the entropy is zero. Um, and that's just set as the benchmark reference point. The entropy of a pure substance um, at absolute zero is uh, the third law of thermodynamics, because there's absolutely no uncertainty about the molecular arrangement of that substance. So we've added an additional law. Um, we have the zeroth law, which has to do with temperature measurement. The first law, which is the energy balance the second law, which is quality of energy, and then the third law, which deals with entropy. Disorganized ent energy doesn't provide very much useful work. So we can think of this in human terms, like if you are, are moving from your house and people are just walking in and out of the house and they're just sort of like carrying a lamp and setting it down over there or, or putting it over here that that's not very useful to you. You need to have organized work in order to get much done. And the same applies for systems. Um, so if we have this disorganized uh, energy, it's not providing very much useful work to us. Um, and as we degrade the quality of our energy, we also produce entropy because we're, we're going from a higher energy state to a lower energy state. And by so doing, that en entropy that was uh, very prevalent and present in that highly disorganized state is now released and given to the surroundings. Um, and real processes occur in the direction of increasing entropy. Okay, so when we talked about how the second law governs the direction of energy transfers from hot to cold, um, it's also in the direction of increasing entropy. So decreasing heat, increasing entropy meaning that the entropy of this highly disorganized but high energy state, as it's being degraded, is producing entropy. Um, there are some special cases that we consider. For example, if the, the system is isothermal, 
And if we look at it as an internally reversible process, meaning we're approximating this, this system itself as reversible, um, that we can take the temperature outside of the integral and just integrate the del Q, which means that our change in entropy is just equal to Q over T sub zero. And that temperature that's given is the temperature of the system boundary. Um, so uh, if it's an isothermal system, the, the temperature of the boundary will be the same as the system as a whole. But undergoing a process that involves heat transfer, the change in entropy is just equal to the heat transfer divided by the temperature of the system. Um, so if we're transferring heat to the system, we will increase entropy. And as we transfer heat from the system, we will decrease the entropy. So the only time the entropy of a system can decrease is when heat is removed, okay? But that's just the system itself. We can decrease the entropy of a system by removing heat. However, if we look at what's happening in the surroundings, the entropy is increasing, okay? So even though momentarily just looking at a snapshot, we can see a decrease in entropy, it's smaller than the increase of en in the entropy of the, of the surroundings as a whole. Okay, so let's do an example and put this into practice. So if we have a piston cylinder device with liquid vapor mixture of water at 300 Kelvin and a constant pressure process, we're transferring 750 kilojoules of heat to the water. And then as a result, part of the liquid in the cylinder vaporizes. So we want to determine the entropy change of the water during this process. So we know that the pressure of state one is equal to the pressure of state two because it's a frictionless piston cylinder device. But in this case, it's also an isothermal process because we're currently undergoing a, a phase change along the saturated liquid vapor line. And so we know if the pressure's not changing, then the temperature would not change either because phase change is a constant temperature, constant pressure process. Okay, so we're adding heat to this piston cylinder device. Pressure's not changing, temperature's not changing, but what will change? The volume, right? Okay, so what we want to determine or calculate is the change in entropy of this particular system. So from the previous slide, we had a special equation that allows us to calculate the change in entropy of an isothermal system. So delta S is just equal to Q over T. And in this case, Q is 750 kilojoules, and what is our temperature? 300K. So calculating that, our entropy change is 250, no, no, sorry, 2.5 kilojoules per Kelvin. Okay, now this number is positive, so the entropy change is positive because heat was being added to the system. Let's just say instead of adding heat, we were removing heat. How would that change the analysis? We'd have a negative, right? So now instead of having a positive Q in, we'd have a negative Q out over T is equal to negative 750 kilojoules over 300 Kelvin. So we'd have a negative 2.5 kilojoules per Kelvin. Well, from this particular picture, it wouldn't be. Okay, but if we were saying, like, instead of adding heat to the system, let's remove heat. So we reverse the arrow, and we say, okay, now it's Q out. So heat is being removed from the system. That's a negative or a heat loss, which means that we have an entropy decrease. So would it be like a reverse um, it's, This is just a, a piston cylinder device, and either we're trying to evaporate the, the fluid or we're trying to condense it. So. It, it, this is just um, not really a useful system necessarily. It's just showing the principle in practice in a steady uh, or not steady flow because it's um, a closed system, but just in a closed system engineering device. So what would happen? Then, you know, later on we can start looking at the, the macroscopic view where we have maybe a, a piston cylinder device. There's also a condenser and evaporator and for a cycle looking at the entropy change. But we won't do that yet. Um, we'll get to that later. So just like all the other um, segments that, that we've had in this class, we kind of build, um, build upon the information that we've learned previously. Okay, so let's do another example. 
This time it's a compressor um, with air in it. And air is compressed from P1 to P2. The air temperature is maintained constant at 25 Celsius during this process. So in order for that to happen, there must be some heat um, leaving the system as a result of the heat transfer to the surroundings at 17 degrees Celsius. So we want to determine the rate of entropy change of the air within the compressor, not the air of the surroundings. We don't necessarily care about that. Um, so we need to state some assumptions that we make in solving this problem uh, that will allow us to do it. So what are some things that we um, might say about a compressor that would be assumptions? So thinking back to chapter five, what are some of the common assumptions that we make in these devices. Well, we have to look at the direction of heat transfer. So in this case, entropy is going to be negative because the heat transfer is to the system, to the surroundings rather than to the system itself. Okay, so we don't necessarily have to make any assumptions about whether entropy is positive or negative at this point. But this, this device is what kind of a device? Steady flow. Okay, so it's a steady flow compressor. Um, and we don't assume that it's adiabatic, right? Because in order for that temperature to, to be maintained at a constant through this process, there has to be some heat removal from it. Because necessarily, as you compress air, the temperature would normally increase. But we're removing some heat to the surroundings so that it won't. Okay, so how do we determine how much heat is being removed? So we've made the steady flow assumption, which means that we're not accumulating mass or energy in our system. So then what tools do we have to analyze steady flow system? Yeah, energy equation, right? So Q dot in minus Q dot out plus work dot in minus work dot out is equal to m dot times h2 minus h1. Okay, do we know um, whether any of these terms can cancel out? Do we have a q in, q out, work in, work out? Okay. What about the terms on this side of the equation? Do we know an m dot? No. Do we know H2 minus H1? We can find it, right? Okay, so how do we do that for this particular working fluid? What is it? What is air? Air is an ideal gas. Okay, so there's another assumption we can make. And what do we know about finding enthalpy for an ideal gas? Cp times T2 minus T1, right? Okay, what's T2? What's T1? So this term goes to zero, which means that our negative Q dot out plus work dot in is equal to zero, or that our work dot in is equal to our Q dot out, which is convenient. Okay, if this were not air, if it were some other substance, we would have to also calculate this term to figure out what our Q dot out is. Because we need Q dot out in order to calculate the rate of entropy change. Okay, so work dot in is equal to Q dot out. That means our Q dot out is equal to 30 kilowatts. Okay, it's not negative, right? So we have to take that into account um, because our, our Q, Q out, um, just by saying that it's a Q out tells us that it's leaving the system. So when we put it into our entropy change equation, then we have to know that it's a negative. That it's, so we have to be very careful about signs. So delta S dot is equal to Q dot over T, and again, because this Q is a Q out, we have to put in negative 30 kilowatts divided by the temperature, which is 25 Celsius, converting to Kelvin, 
because we always need to use the absolute temperature in these equations as well, we get a negative 0 0.101 kilowatts per Kelvin. Yeah, Q dot work dot, it's energy per time in this case. So kilowatt is equal to a kilojoule per second. So Q and, and W will always have the same units, or they should if you're doing it right. So um, if, it's a, if it's not with a dot above it, it's a kilojoule, which is just a unit of energy, and a kilowatt is energy per time. So you're finding the rate of energy change. So a kilojoule is like a total amount of energy. Kilojoule per second is how that, that energy is changing per time. Okay. Any other questions on this? Okay, so what is the point of doing this? Why would we want to calculate the change in entropy of a system? Why would that ever be useful to us, do you think? Um, it tells us how irreversible it is. So we could compare two different processes, one to another, and say, okay, maybe we're not looking at efficiency per se, but if we start looking at the entropy change, we can see, okay, this, this system is, has a greater entropy change, which in effect means that it's more irreversible than the other system. Okay. It's hard to say bad, but in, in many cases when you're looking at two different processes and you're trying to determine which one is the best, then you would look for the one with the lower entropy change because that means you're losing less of your, your potential to do work. Um, there's another term called exergy, which is the opposite of entropy. So in this course, in the first um, half of thermodynamics, you can either teach all the stuff we've taught up to this point plus entropy or plus exergy. And they're the same idea, but it's like the, the, good, the dark side and the light side kind of a thing. So exergy is like the opposite of entropy. Um, so you want more exergy and less entropy. So it's kind of an interesting thing. Okay, so the increase of entropy principle, so from the, equal, the inequality of Clausius, we know that del Q over T is always less than or equal to zero. Um, so if we consider a cycle made up of two processes, and this again is how this increase of entropy principle or the entropy generation principle is derived. So we're going to say that from one to two, it's just some arbitrary process. But from two to one, it's an internally reversible process. So we're, we're performing some cycle um, starting at point one, going to two, and then back to one. And we're doing from one to two is reversible, irreversible. We don't really care. But back from two to one, we're going to say is a reversible or internally reversible process. So we're adding those two together. And if you add two things together that are less than or equal to zero, they would also have to be less than or equal to zero. This term right here, we can rewrite as S2 minus S1, or S1 minus S2, um, because we're going from 2 to 1. It's S1 minus S2. So we're just manipulating this equation, and it's still less than or equal to 0. So if we rearrange the terms, moving this S1 minus S2 to the other side of the equation and uh, flipping them, as we do, then we find that S2 minus S1 is always greater than or equal to this del Q over T. So the inequality will hold true for the case where 1 to 2 is an irreversible process, meaning that S2 minus S1, this reversible uh, change in entropy, is always going to be greater than or equal to this uh, irreversible change in entropy. And then if they're both reversible, then it will be equal. Um, so the change in entropy is always going to be greater than the entropy that is transferred as we undergo some process from one to two. I know, I see puzzled looks and furrowed eyebrows. Um, we'll use this in practice. So there's always some entropy created during an irreversible process. That's what it means. Okay, so we talked previously about how entropy is sort of like a property of a system. So if we go to the tables, you can see that there's a column for entropy. So if we're undergoing a process between state one and state two, we can go to the table, we can look up the entropy at state one and the entropy at state two. But we can get from one to two in many different ways. And the process we take to go from one to two will determine how much entropy is generated. Does that make sense? 
So there's some entropy at state one, some entropy at state two, and then we also generate some entropy going between the two states. Okay, so we're accounting for all of these different values, the change in entropy, as well as how much entropy is generated during that process. So if it's a reversible process, the entropy generation is zero, because it means that there are no losses. If it's an irreversible process, then it always will have to be greater than zero. Okay, so entropy generation is not a property of the system itself. It's a property of the process going between those two states, whereas the change in entropy is a property of the system. So, um, so we, have to, we have to look at it sort of like heat transfer and sort of like enthalpy change, that we're looking at not only the initial and final state, but also how we get from state one to state two. And then for an isolated system, meaning that it's an adiabatic closed system, so there's no heat transfer, there's no mass transfer, then this entropy generation term is all that we have to consider. So there's no change in entropy, there's just this entropy generation term. And then it's always going to be a positive term unless it's a reversible system, in which case it would be zero. Okay, so this, this delta S, we uh, consider ourselves only when it's um, uh, a non-isolated system, meaning that there's heat transfer, mass transfer. But if there's no heat transfer, no mass transfer, really there's not, not much happening in our system, but there can still be entropy generation. Okay, so let's do some examples on this. That we want to compare two different processes, okay, or, or two different uh, ideas of the system. Um, so heat in the amount of 200 kilojoules is transferred directly from a high temperature reservoir at 1500 Kelvin to a low temperature reservoir at 300 Kelvin. So we want to calculate the entropy change of the two different reservoirs to determine if we're satisfying the increase of entropy principle. And then imagine if we reverse that process and instead try to transfer heat from 300 Kelvin to 1500 Kelvin we can calculate the entropy change of the two reservoirs and then see if we've satisfied the increase of entropy principle. And just by looking at this, do you think that the, the second part of the example, do you think that it will be satisfying the increase of entropy principle? Do you think we're going to generate entropy or somehow we're destroying entropy? Is it a possible system? Can we do that? No, we can't, right? So we can't transfer heat from 300 Kelvin to 1500 Kelvin. We're reversing the flow. We're violating the second law. So calculating the entropy change will allow us to, in numbers, prove that we are violating the second law. Okay, so we can look at this. Um, from a holistic viewpoint and say, well, we can't do that because it's impossible. And then we can also now show with numbers that it can't be done because we're violating this mathematical principle. Okay, so in order to do this, we have a source and we have a sink. So the source is in the first part, 1500 Kelvin, and the sink is 300 Kelvin. So we have to find the change in entropy of the source and also the change in entropy of the sink. Okay, so delta S of the source is going to be equal to this Q over T and is the heat leaving that 1500 Kelvin or is it entering? It's leaving so it's a negative 200 kilojoules because it's a Q out divided by the temperature of the sink which is 1500 Kelvin. Okay, so the change in entropy of the source in this particular problem is 0 0.1333 kilojoules per Kelvin. And the change in entropy of the sink is also equal to Q over T. But in this case, we have Q in, so it's a positive. We're adding heat to our system, 200 kilojoules. But now our temperature is 300 Kelvin. So the change in entropy of the sink is going to be 0 0.53, no, sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself, 0 
kilojoules per Kelvin. To find the total entropy change of the system equals the change in entropy of the source plus the change in entropy of the sink. So in this case, it's negative 0 0.1333 plus 0 0.6667 kilojoules per Kelvin. So we get 0 0.533 kilojoules per Kelvin. Okay, so we find that we are satisfying this increase of entropy principle. So we have a net positive entropy change when we consider the entire system and surroundings. So this is like system plus the surroundings. Okay, so now let's look at the second case. So we still have a source and a sink, but in this first problem, instead of the source being the 1500K, our source is the 300K. So we have negative 200 kilojoules leaving 300 Kelvin. So we get a negative 0 0.6667. And then we have ne uh, 200 kilojoules being added to a sink at 1500 Kelvin, which is a positive 0 0.1333 kilojoules per Kelvin. Okay, so this is like case two over here. So you see how the source has become the sink. Are you following me with this? Yes? No? I see glassy eyes. Okay, so then if we add these two together, we get a negative 0 0.533 kilojoules per Kelvin. So we're not satisfying the increase in entropy principle because we have a negative. We're saying somehow that we've destroyed en entropy during this process, which is not possible. Okay, so we can look at that and we say, okay, well, you can't transfer heat from a cold to a hot. Like, we know that physically. But then mathematically, entropy can't be destroyed. We've got this negative number, so I can prove it mathematically that it's also not possible. Okay. An isolated system can also be defined as the system plus its surroundings. So this entropy generation is equal to the change in total entropy. Um, and it always has to be greater than or equal to zero. So if this were a reversible process, somehow we were transferring heat from a reservoir at the same temperature to another reservoir at the same temperature, then these terms would go to uh, be equal and the entropy generation would be zero. Yes? Yes. So this one is saying that entropy has increased during this process. So the entropy of the source changed, right? So there's this 1500 Kelvin source, and we're removing heat from it and adding it to another place. Okay, so the removal of heat from this temperature and the addition of heat to this temperature creates some overall net change in the entropy balance of the universe not the universe, but this system and surroundings as a whole. So if we're removing heat from a source, adding it to the sink, we have to, to determine how much entropy changes at the source and at the sink, which we do through this Q over T. So this is an isothermal uh, process because the boundary of that, that piece is the same. So it's Q over T. So the entropy of the source is decreasing by this much but the entropy of the sink is increasing by this much. And if we add those two together, so we say, okay, the source plus the sink is the total system in the system. So it's like this here. This entropy generation is delta S total. We're saying that there's a net effect of increasing the entropy of the universe by this much because we've performed this heat transfer process. Okay, so then in the other case, we're saying, okay, well, I don't want to do it that way. I want to reverse the heat, and I'm going to try to do this. And then it says, oh, well, that's impossible, because this shows that you just destroyed entropy, and we know that we can't do that. Okay, it violates the third law of thermodynamics. 
So ultimately what we're looking at is how much disorder and uh, chaos we've created by performing everyday life. Uh, so will, will it ever be zero? If it's a reversible process. So let's look at the case where, let's just say, for example, that we're transferring heat and instead of being 1500 Kelvin, this is also 300 Kelvin. Then this would be negative 0 0.6667. So transferring heat from bodies that are the same temperature is a reversible process. Okay, but you, nothing really happens when two bodies are the same temperature. So like in theory on paper, it's a reversible process because it doesn't actually happen in the first place. I think that's why it's reversible. Um, but anytime you transfer heat, it's an irreversible process. Okay, except if the two things are the same temperature. But you can't really transfer heat when two things are the same temperature. So we can approximate a reversible process if it were like 299.99999 Kelvin. And then we'd have a very infinitesimally small entropy increase. But does that do us any good? No. Actually, this one would have to be the 29999, that one, because that one still has to be bigger. Does that make sense? So anytime you transfer heat, you're going to be creating entropy. It's just the nature of the beast. Which is why philo philosophers over time and this, uh, like thinking about this idea of entropy, it like um, has caused them to, uh, yeah, have like uh, mental breakdowns. Okay. <laughs> like thinking it like, okay, well, everything's going to decay, right? So like, what's the point of life? I don't think that. I think that there's grander play. But anyway, okay, so an isolated system is the system plus its surroundings. And we can consider the universe to be an isolated system. So the entropy of the universe is constantly increasing. Um, so it's important to note also that the change of a system can be less than zero, like we showed previously. So this was a negative change in this system. But entropy generation can never be zero because we also have to consider the surroundings. So if we're transferring from one body to another, that's like the system plus the surroundings. We have to consider the entropy, that when we look at entropy generation, we look at all of that together. So a single system can have a net decrease in entropy. That doesn't violate the increase of entropy principle. But when we look at the system plus the surroundings, it has to be positive. Okay, so let's do another example. So we want to determine these two heat transfer processes, which is more irreversible. So thinking about that, how, how do you determine if something is more irreversible than another? What, what is going to tell you that? If it's more reversible, it'll have a lower value of entropy. But if it's more irreversible, it'll have a greater value. Yeah. So we look at the entropy value, so we're going to perform the same analysis on two separate systems. These two systems are both real systems because they're transferring heat from high to low temperature. We can see that. And just looking at it, just guessing, which one do you think is going to be more irreversible after our discussion that we just, we just had? So A, you think it's going to be more irreversible and that B will be more reversible? Okay. Yeah, because there's a greater temperature difference between the source and the sink in part A than in part B. So we should be able to show that numerically. That's, that's what we would expect. That's what we should see that A is more irreversible. Okay, so this change in entropy total, which is also equal to S gen, is equal to, again, the change in entropy of the source plus the change in entropy of the sink. So it's Q source over T of the source plus Q sink over T of the sink. Sour source. Okay. So we can do that for both. So for part A, we have Q is equal to 2,000 kilojoules. And it, from the source, Q of the source, is it a positive or is it a negative? 
is, ent is heat entering or leaving. Okay, so it's a negative 2,000 kilojoules indicating that it's leaving the source and going to the sink over 800 Kelvin plus 2,000 kilojoules over 500 Kelvin. So we come up with 1.5 kilojoules per Kelvin for that one. So that's how much entropy is generated by this process. Part B, we have again negative 2,000 kilojoules over 800 Kelvin. But this time we have 2,000 kilojoules over 750 Kelvin. So we find the entropy generation now is 0.16667 kilojoules per Kelvin. So B is more reversible. It's not reversible, because if it were reversible, this would be zero, but it's more reversible. And this is more irreversible reversible or less reversible. There's many different ways you can say it. This is more reversible or less irreversible. So um, you can get caught up on the language of that, but the idea is still the same. That as you perform that process, there's less entropy generated, meaning less disorder added to the universe. Okay, any questions on that? So again, be very careful about your signs on Q. So if it's a Q out, it's going to be a negative. If it's a Q in, it's going to be positive because you're adding heat to the system. Um, if you do both of them as positive, then it messes up your results. Okay, so some additional remarks about this, that processes can't just occur in any arbitrary direction. We've talked about that with the second law. Um, and the, the increase of entropy principle proves that mathematically. So also, entropy is not a conserved property. So there is not an entropy balance equals to zero um, unless it's a cycle for reversible processes. So it's conserved only during ideal reversible processes. And every other process, entropy won't increase. Okay, you can have um, a decrease of entropy of a system, but for the process, the entropy generation is always going to be greater than zero. So in order to look at the entropy generation of a process, you have to look at the system and the surroundings. And then the performance of engineering devices, of course, as we've looked at this, we can tell that something that is more irreversible um, is a better bet or something that's, no, more irreversible is worse. Less reversible is worse. More reversible is better. Okay, get confusing with that. So. A better way of looking at that is the less entropy you generate, the better for your process. Okay, so you can compare different processes and see, you know, which one is going to be a better, uh, a better bet for my system. How can I look at these? So instead of just looking at efficiencies, maybe you now can look also at entropy generation to determine which process best suits your needs. Okay, um, so entropy is a property, as we talked about previously, that it's in the tables. So if you look at your book, we determine entropy values the same way that we do for, for all other property values. So uh, like in table A5, for example, I can get there, A4, A5, any of those, the far right-hand column, past enthalpy is entropy, which we've just sort of ignored up until now, but now we're going to have to start looking at it. So there's saturated liquid properties, there's saturated vapor properties, so entropy is a property at the system. And again, the base point for that, or the zero point for entropy, is defined also at absolute zero. So these tables are created based on absolute zero being the, the main, uh, the baseline. Um, an interesting note on that, though, is that in many cases, we're far more concerned about the change in entropy than we are about actual entropy values at the, the beginning and final state. So, Usually we don't care what the base point is. You can set any arbitrary base point because it's the delta S that we really care about. Um, but you know, for convenience and to be consistent, uh, we use absolute zero. 
Um, so we determine the properties the same way. And then again, if we need to make the compressed liquid approximation, we use the saturated liquid table and the S sub F values at the same temperature if needed. So you can see, you know, this is just under the dome, outside the dome. It's the same principles that we have used for any other property value. It's just now we have entropy. And be very careful that you're not confusing entropy, which sounds similar to enthalpy, because they're very, very different in practice. So more pictures. Um, it's helpful for us actually to, to show entropy on TS diagrams, um, temperature with entropy, as well as on a, um, a Q, or a, no, 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 TS diagram. So the area under the curve on a TS diagram is heat transfer. Okay, so let's do another problem with this. So we can kind of see how it works to use the tables and look up entropy values. So in this case, we have a rigid tank which is divided equally in half by a partition. One part of the tank is evacuated, the other has 1.5 kilograms of compressed liquid water at 300 kilopascals and 60 Celsius. Um, so the partition is removed and the water expands to fill the entire tank. So we want to determine the entropy change of the water during this process if the final pressure in the tank is 15 kilopascals. Okay, so this is similar to other problems that we've done, but instead of trying to determine the heat transfer or trying to determine some other uh, quantities, which we could also do, we're now interested in figuring out how much the entropy changes. So what, what, uh, what type of system is this? It's a closed system, right? Because mass is not crossing the boundary. We could analyze it as an open system if we use the partition itself as our, uh, as our boundary, but that makes it more complicated, so let's not do that. So if we use the entire uh, square box or rigid tank as our system. We assume that it's a closed system, so even though mass is moving through this system, it's not leaving the system at all. So on one side is uh, 1.5 kilograms of compressed liquid water, and it's 300 kilopascals and 60 Celsius. So how would we determine any of our property values or what property values might we need in order to, to do this problem? Can we fix the state? What do we have? Okay, compressed liquid. We know the pressure. We know the temperature. Does that fix the state for compressed liquid? Oh, you guys. Let's look at the dome again. Where is compressed liquid? Here, right? Okay, is pressure and temperature, are they dependent over here? The only place where pressure and temperature cannot be used to solely fix the state is under the dome because pressure and temperature are dependent. Over here, pressure and temperature tell us exactly where we, we need to be. Okay, so yes, we can fix the state. The question is then, do we have a compressed liquid table that's at 300 kilopascals and 60 Celsius, which I don't think we do because it starts at 5 megapascals. So what do we do to look up property values when we don't have a good compressed liquid table. Well, we have to look it up before we can solve anything. <laughs> How do we, what do we do? What's the approximation we can make? Okay, so if we have, if we're trying to look up any property, including entropy, at a certain temperature and pressure, and we don't have the compressed liquid table, we can approximate it as a saturated liquid at the same temperature. Right? Do you remember that from before? Come on, guys, shake out the cobwebs. Okay, so at the state one, we have P1 is equal to, what, 300 kilopascals. T1 is equal to 60 degrees Celsius. And S1, we're saying, is equal to the saturated liquid property, or S sub F, at 60 degrees Celsius. So if we go to our table, for liquid water at 60 Celsius, what do we find is our entropy value? 300 kilopascal, 60 Celsius, 
we don't have a compressed liquid table, so we have to look it up at the temperature, which is 60 Celsius. Entropy. What are we? What are we doing? Mm, that would be S sub F G. So that's the change in entropy if it were being evaporated from a liquid to gas. So that one's not right. Yeah, that's the zero point eight three one three. And what are the units on that? Kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Where else have we seen these units? C sub P, R. Hmm, they come up more than once. Okay, so then we'll also want to look up our specific volume, which again is V sub F at 60 degrees C. What is that value? Uh, 0.001. Yeah, 0 0.001017 meters cubed per kilogram. Okay, now state two. We know the what? Pressure is 15 kilopascals. What's our second property value to fix the state? Volume. What do we know about volume? Okay, so V2 is equal to 2 times V1, which is 0 0.002034 meters cubed per kilogram. So then using that, that pressure and specific volume, we can go to the um, saturated liquid vapor mixture table and see that at 15 kilopascals, table A, A5, <coughs> we're in between V sub F and V sub G. Because V sub F is 0 0.001014 and V sub G is 10.02. So we need to calculate our quality because S2 is going to be S sub F plus X times S F G. Do you remember how to calculate quality? V2 minus V sub F over V F G. Okay, so our quality is actually quite small. It's 1.018 times 10 to the minus 4. So we're just slightly evaporated. So we can calculate S2 is equal to 0 0.7556 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. So again, we're looking up S sub F and SFG at 15 kilopascals and then using this quality to calculate our S2. Okay, so then delta S is just equal to S2 minus S1, and we can uh, multiply through by the mass to get uh, M delta S is equal to big, that one looks big, S2 minus big S1. So either of these two values in the first case, it's negative 0.757 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And then this one is negative 0 0.1136 kilojoules per Kelvin. Okay, so the total entropy change is multiplied by the mass, and then the specific entropy change is just this small delta S. Okay, but this is negative. Didn't we just say it can't be negative? How is that possible? Is this an irreversible, impossible process? Maybe. Who knows? How would I ever know? Okay, what's going on here really? What's happening really? Can the entropy of a system decrease? Yes. The entropy of a system can decrease. Can the entropy of a system plus its surroundings decrease? No. Okay. Yeah. So some of our entropy is leaving our system, which means probably what is happening? Heat transfer. Yeah. So there's maybe some heat transfer going on. There's also some um, 
due to the uh, expansion of the gas, there's some entropy loss, right, or the expansion of fluid. So we're losing some entropy to the surroundings. So if we wanted to be really thorough and figure out what our entropy generation is during this process, then we would say, okay, I know that my entropy change of my system is this. I'm going to figure out how much heat was transferred to the surroundings, and then I'm going to calculate the entropy um, generation due to that heat transfer. And you'll come up with a positive value. So I know it's, I know it's confusing. Entropy is so hard to understand. Your entropy of your system can change. And it can be negative. But if you look at the system plus the surroundings, it has to be positive. Okay, so a system that's losing heat can have an entropy decrease. That's possible. Just like when we did the source in the sink. The source can have an entropy decrease. But that, that will be matched or greater by, uh, or be a greater value um, when you look at the surroundings. Okay, so the, the entropy de decrease of the system will be less than the entropy increase of the surrounding. So what's the difference between the delta S and the delta? This is just in specific terms, so it's divided through by the math, you know, like kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. But anytime they ask for like the total entropy change, in this case they just say the entropy change. If it says total entropy change, that means you have to multi through, multiply through by the mass. Because this is telling you how much it's changing per unit mass, and this is telling you total how much has changed because of how much mass we have in the system. So in this case, the mass was 1.5 kilograms. So if we just multiply through by 1.5, um, that number, those numbers aren't right. Hold on, I might have reversed them. Something's funky about that because that number should be bigger than that number. I've done something wrong. Somebody calculate that 0.75 should be 15. <laughs> ah. One point one three six. How many semesters have I done this and nobody's caught that? I've never caught that? All right. Okay, any other questions on that? I guarantee to you that entropy will be um, the hardest thing you'll ever try to understand in your whole engineering career. Okay, any other? Any other? All right. Okay, so let's talk about the exam, talking about difficult things. Um, so the exam is going to cover all the materials we've covered up through chapter uh, six and this uh, last little bit about entropy. So the focus is going to be on the material since the last exam, meaning heat pumps, heat engines, um, refrigerators, plus a little bit about entropy. You also will need to know about like perpetual motion um, and stuff like that. So again, close book, close note. Uh, except for the two sheets front and back of your own prepared notes. Calculators are allowed. I'll give you property tables. Um, please keep in mind that if I give you property tables, that you should use the property tables and not try to calculate some other way. So like if you have a property table for, let's say, water, you don't need to use C sub P delta T to calculate changes in uh, enthalpy. You need to use the table and look it up. Um, and an equation sheet will be included. So it will be um, similar to what you've seen in the past, but it will have some additional equations on it. So, yeah. Concepts to know, you should already understand all of these ones. So unit systems, how to use them, temperature scales, how to look up properties, how to calculate quality, um, phases and phase changes, ideal gas law, boundary work, shaft work, electrical work, being able to recognize those things. So like boundary work, for example, knowing that there is boundary work when any time the boundary moves, like in a piston cylinder device. Flow work, energy transport by mass, specific heat, mass and energy balance for closed and open systems, analysis of steady flow engineering devices, mass and energy balance for unsteady flow devices, 
and then any definitions that have been given through the notes. So this is all the stuff that you should already know, hopefully. This is new stuff. The second law and the implications of the second law. Um, so uh, Blake came in and asked some questions about like perpetual motion machines and perpetual motion devices and like wh what does it mean for irreversibilities and how do we know you know how to how to distinguish these things it's very important that you understand the first law is energy balance and the second law is energy quality okay so there's a lot of stuff that goes into the second law like the Kelvin Planck and Clausius statements the Carnot principles those are all based on the second law so if there were a problem on the exam that asked you to identify um, if this is a perpetual motion machine of the first kind or the second kind, meaning is it violating first law or the second law, being able to fundamentally understand the difference between the two is important. Um, so thermal efficiencies, coefficient of performance, being able to calculate those. Also uh, be very, very careful on exams when you do that, that you're using the correct form of the equation. It'll be given to you. But also test, uh, test what you've written down based on your own physical understanding. So what, when we're talking about efficiency or coefficient of performance, it's always the desired outcome over the required input, right? So make sure you understand that. Know the Carnot and the reverse Carnot cycle. It would be very helpful to you, I think, to look at the diagram of the Carnot cycle and the reverse Carnot cycle and be able to replicate that. So what are those processes that, that, um, that the Carnot cycle undergoes? And then this last little bit about entropy, um, there will be one problem where you will have to calculate maybe the total entropy generation or the entropy change that you will be required to do that. Um, and then there may be some concept questions about entropy, like what is entropy? What does it represent? What does it mean? Can it increase? Can it decrease? What are the governing kind of um, factors that we've, we've talked about today? So I'm not going to ask you to replicate like the derivation of the Clausius inequality, but I would expect you to understand that entropy is always increasing, that the increase of entropy principle deals with system plus the surroundings. So the entropy generation has to be positive, but for an individual system, it can be negative. So know that. And then um, it'd be a good idea for you to just read through the text and familiarize yourself with that. The types of problems to expect will be similar to what we have done on, ho on um, homework and previous exams. Um, and you should expect that concepts from chapter five will be combined with problems from chapter six. So we've done some homework on that. We've done some examples on class. Uh, that means that instead of saying, like this would be a really easy exam problem, right? If I was like, okay, here's a heat engine. Uh, we have QH and I give you QH. Here's workout and I give you workout. What's QL? You know, I'm not gonna give you a problem that easy on the exam. I'm going to say, Okay, so there's this heat engine, and we have maybe a turbine here with an inlet of this and an, in, and an outlet of that. Um, calculate Q sub L. So you'll first have to calculate the workout to find Q sub L. So it would be something like that rather than just adding numbers together, because that doesn't test your understanding, nor does it test your um, ability as an engineer. So some examples of what I'm talking about are there. Um, and then uh, problems, again, that require knowledge of reversible versus irreversible, and then also first law versus second law types of problems. And then there will be at least one problem that has entropy in it. So keep that in mind. All right. Any questions? Good luck. Enjoy your weekend. <laughs>